So for well over 10 years, our company slogan has been um, local wood with the story. And today we embark on a new journey of sharing those stories through virtual uh, webinars and platforms. Sustainable wood stories will take place once every two months uh, and it will focus on the unique aspects of our products origins, customer projects, local suppliers, environmental challenges facing our society and methods our industry is using to address them. Today, the topic to kick off sustainable wood stories is Western Juniper, sustaining Oregon communities through these troubling times. With every purchase we make, we have the opportunity to consider how and where the raw material for that product is, is extracted from the earth, whether or not the people were par paid a fair wage for their labor, and how the product, how far the product had, a tra had to travel from its original point to your home. Often these, th we must make compromises and the negative trade-offs um, of this purchasing can be overwhelming, but not so with Juniper. Purchasing Western Juniper is a win-win all around. It's a win for restoring rangeland. It's a win for small businesses in rural Oregon. It's a win for salmon and sage grouse. It's a win for you because it's a naturally durable product with a be beautiful rustic aesthetic. Today's stories, um, through today's stories, we hope to, that you learn the power of buying Western Juniper can have on your na Oregon neighbors near and far. Our first speaker today will, will help set the scientific context for Juniper's place in the rangeland ecosystem and why its responsible removal is beneficial. Dr. Tony Svakar of Burns, Oregon is a rangeland eco ecologist and part-time research faculty appointment with Oregon State University. His primary area of research has been rangeland ecology and ecophysiology with an emphasis on restoration and management of sage, brush, steep, and riparian vegetation. Aside from his work at Oregon State University, he consults with state and federal agencies, private landowners, and non-governmental organizations on science and natural resource issues. Okay. So hopefully everybody sees this map, and it's basically a distribution map of uh, Western Juniper. Uh, to, well, Western Juniper is in green, it's uh, Oxentalis, subspecies Oxentalis, and then there's a subspecies called Sierra Juniper that's further to the south. Now I could have done a more impressive um, a distribution map and if you see one that looks like it's more um, impressive than this, it's because they will color in counties where the species occurs. And so that would make, uh, can you guys see my pointer or can I only see my pointer? Probably you can't see my pointer. So anyway, there's maps that show all of these counties colored in and it looks like a much wider distribution, but this gives you a better sense of where the juniper actually occurs and uh, where it's dominant. So you can see Eastern Oregon uh, has the majority of um, acres of Western juniper and it's scattered around other areas with quite a concentration in, in Northeast California and parts of Northern Nevada as well. Uh, and this is Western juniper. And if you go further East into the South, and get into um, the pinion juniper, that is Utah juniper. So we're talking specifically about Western juniper. So Lynn, if we go to the next slide. And fire, fire history is really important. Now keep in mind, Western juniper is a native species. And this is some work that Rick Miller and Jeff Rose did on the Steens. And they aged, I think it was something like 1400 juniper plant uh, trees. Nice thing about working with woody vegetation, you can age them. And you can see that prior to 1875, there are very few juniper. And once we, uh, during the settlement period, we really disrupted fire cycles. And you can see then after the 30s, the drought of the 30s, we saw this exponential increase in number of individuals of Western juniper. So this looks very much like a weed population graph. So if we go to the next, um, actually the next one. Yeah, there you go. So fire, fire is a very important part of the story with Western juniper. There are a lot of areas, particularly the more productive sagebrush areas that um, had fire return intervals that would have not allowed Western juniper to dominate. And when we disrupted those fire cycles, either through suppression or through the, the uh, unrestricted grazing that occurred in the late 1800s and early 1900s, 
uh, and increase those, those fire return intervals or eliminate fire entirely, we saw this large expansion in western juniper. So if we go to the next slide. Um, wow, it looks a lot out of, out of focus, but that's, uh, this is a, a shot from the Steens, and you can see a lot of small individuals. There's a few big trees. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, you know, this kind of illustrates the point here where you have bigger individuals, but look at all the small trees in the inner space. And over time, those trees will fill in and you'll basically lose a portion of the uh, bunch grass, uh, sagebrush vegetation that was in the understory. If we go to the next one. So this, this is a very productive site in Northeastern California in the Alturas area. You can see juniper can be very thick and very dominant. And that led us early on to try and classify phases of juniper dominance. And so we go to the next slide. Um, we broke it into three sort of categories. The phase one, where you see some trees coming in. And depending on the site, this is highly variable, but it can take 30 to 40 years for juniper to top the sagebrush canopy. So often if you see a few junipers sticking their noses above the sagebrush, it means there's probably a lot more individuals out there if you start go, if you go out on the site and walk around. So this is a site where the where the sagebrush and bunch grass still kind of dominate, but we're seeing trees. Uh, then if we go to phase two, that would be the next. Yeah, th then we get to a stage where the the um, sagebrush and bunch grasses are still hanging in there. They're still uh, doing quite well, but you begin to see uh, juniper establishing and maybe suppressing. Uh, plants right below the 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 understory or the uh, canopy of the juniper, and then we get to a point where the juniper dominates. And how long this takes varies by site, so I'm not going to go into that. But at this point, oh, we just go back for a sec. At this point, if you look at that phase three, uh, we've lost all of our shrubs, and on some sites we lo lose most of our grasses, and on other sites we retain some of our grasses. But clearly, juniper is dominating this site. So those are the three phases that. that people will probably talk about in later presentations. Uh, as I said, juniper was a, is a native species, and it, but it was confined to specific areas historically. So these are areas we would typically call fire safe sites, meaning these rocky ridges where you didn't have a lot of understory, there weren't a lot of fine fuels to carry the fire. So these are areas that really didn't have many fires historically, and this is where the really old trees occur. Uh, next slide, please. And just the extent, now these numbers are probably a little dated. My slide's a little old. The bottom, it says 90% of woodlands are 100 years or less. I should be saying 110 years or less by now. Uh, but it just gives you the sense of the number of ac the acreage of western juniper. As I say, I think these numbers now are probably quite a bit higher. These estimates are probably 20 years ago, and juniper expands at a fairly high rate. So. Uh, next slide, please. This is some early work we did on the steens. This is an area that has a restrictive layer, uh, about 18 to 24 inches in the soil. There's a hard pan, and it, it keeps the juniper roots fairly shallow. And so you lose, you can see the dead sagebrush in sort of the middle lower part of the picture. A lot of the bunch grasses are gone. Um, on these kinds of sites, juniper can really have a, a negative effect on other vegetation. So if we go to the next slide. And all we did here, we didn't seed, we didn't do any treatment other than simply removing the competition from juniper. That's all we did. And this is only uh, two years after the juniper was removed. You can see the needles are still on the trees there. It takes about three years for all the needles to drop. So the vegetation came back fairly quickly. Again, all we did was remove the competition. So, okay, next one, please. So we, we had you know, a fair amount, almost a decade of, of information on vegetation on these sites. And so we paired up with some hydrologists to see if we could look at what effect juniper dominance had on runoff and erosion. And if we go to the next one. And this is what's called rainfall simulation work. And we had a, a group in Boise we were able to work with that does this kind of work. If you look at the, the tent, which is to keep the researchers dr as dry as possible, um, there's basically metal that outlines this plot. You can kind of see it. If you see those standpipes, if you go to the base. So we're basically raining on a, 
defined area and we keep that area the same, we have to move this setup from plot to plot. And so we had, we had cut and uncut, and then we had eight replications of, of this particular uh, treatment. So we rained on it for a couple hours. This is a site where juniper was still dominated, or still dominated, and if we look at the next slide, this is the kind of runoff we'd get. So we'd, we'd do, do the treatment for about an hour. We'd rain on the site for an hour, and then we would catch. You can see how muddy that, that site is, and look at what happens when you have bare ground. You can kind of see that the surface soil is dislodged by the, the uh, rainfall, and we would record this to be able to see how much water and sediment came off of this plot. And then if we go to the next site, there, this is actually being rained on, but there's just no runoff occurring. Basically, when the bunch grasses come back, and these are all native bunch grasses, and, and thicken up in a plot, it, it, is, it allows the, the water to go into the soil, and basically um, you get very little runoff. So if we look at the next, th this is the actual, the actual data that came off of this study, uh, the, the uh, sediment yield in tons per acre uh, is the axis and then time uh, in minutes on the bottom. And so you can see the red line is the, the plots where juniper remained and the, the uh, green line is the, are the plots where uh, juniper was removed and the, bunch, the native bunch grasses came back. So you can see after an hour of raining on this plot, it was a fairly intense rainstorm, but we, we get you know, a fair amount of rainstorms like this that would last at least half an hour. So you can see that you know, it's almost half a ton of sediment after 60 minutes of, uh, of raining on the plot versus virtually nothing where the native bunch grasses came back. Um, so if we go to the next. So just to kind of sum this up, we've had these significant changes in juniper density over time. Uh, we see a loss in uh, understory and where that happens, and it's particularly relevant to sites that have these restrictive layers, uh, we tend to get fairly high runoff in erosion. Now we also see a change in plant diversity and wildlife habitat, and um, Terry mentioned sage grouse. Uh, there's been quite a bit of research showing that in, at relatively low levels of juniper invasion or expansion, uh, sage grouse leave an area because the juniper provides perch points for hawks, for raptors that are basically going to sit up in the trees and and uh, and look for uh, prey, and so the sage grouse tend to leave the leave an area at somewhere between two and four percent juniper cover, which is a pretty low value. Um, so we see this change, and some species are benefited and some not by by uh, juniper. At low levels, there are some species that do well with juniper, but in general, as you get to these advanced stages, you see a reduction in plant diversity and there are a number of wildlife species that are negatively impacted. And we see this increase in soil erosion. So anyway, that's my Cliff Notes, um, Cliff Notes version of juniper ecology. Thank you for that, Dr. Spica. I appreciate the, uh, the, the, the follow-up on some of that research. Bringing the geographical lens into a, a closer look, we're going to focus now um, on uh, uh, Weaver and Gillam County with a one-two punch from Herb Winters and Damon Brosnan. Herb Winters of Fossil Oregon has worked for the Soil and Water Conservation Districts in Weaver and Gillam Counties since 2008. Currently is the project manager at the Gillam Soil and Water Conservation District. And Damon Brosnan of Condon, Oregon graduated from Oregon State in 1991. And after more than two decades uh, on ranches and as a soil conservationist, he found himself as the district conservationist for the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, which is a, you'll hear those letters bantered about in uh, this field um, for both Gillum and Wheeler County. So Herb and Damon work together and hence are gonna present together. Thanks for coming, fellas. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you, Terry. So I guess we can go to the next uh, slide, please, Lynn. Just want to let you know uh, where we work. Uh, the uh, North County in green is Gillum. South County in blue is Wheeler County. Uh, we're in the, the John Day Basin, which is a very important mid-Columbia Steelheads uh, river system. Uh, it's, a hatcher, it's a fishery that 
has zero dams, uh, and one of our major focuses uh, in our type of work is uh, trying to um, improve habitats for mid Columbia steelhead. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, to talk about how we pay for it, uh, over the years, past 10 years, it's been a major focus uh, in partnering with other agencies. So we have the John Day Basin Partnership. Uh, we have 28 different organizations that's part of that partnership. And that has helped us be successful in uh, receiving large grant awards to perform this restoration work. We focus on long, landscape scale restoration efforts, uh, all our partners are involved doing different parts of each uh, restoration project on the landscape. Like I mentioned, it's uh, a lot of our funding is geared towards uh, native improving native fish habitat. And part of that is uh, removing juniper off of the uh, slopes in the John Day Basin. And uh, Damon can talk about how uh, we prioritize where we're going to treat uh, juniper to have the best uh, so, uh, Lynn, next slide, please. All right. So, um, about, oops, back one. <laughs> one more back. There you go. Thank you. So, about 15 years ago, um, we had uh, decided, we came together and decided there wasn't enough restoration money in the world to treat all the juniper in Eastern Oregon, let alone in Wheeler County. So we uh, needed to come up with a method to do it in such a way that we could use our money to the best effect possible, get the best bang for our buck, and, um, and do the most good for the landscape and for the landowners that we are doing the work for, cost sharing on. So we decided that uh, we would work with basically aspects and soils um, and look for those areas that historically, as uh, the doctor had mentioned earlier, uh, had little to no presence of juniper because uh, historically wildfires had removed them um, before we settled this country. So we started looking at those north facing aspects, um, those deeper soiled sites, those sites that uh, hold the, that produce the most forage um, and other plants and also hold the most water. So as you can see, um, the next one, please. The idea was to, as many of you have probably heard, you know, capture, oops, capture, store, and release water back into the system um, to uh, those junipers are also tend to be in phase one and phase two loosely. Uh, they're not that old, but they're growing on sites that they rapidly grow. Um, a lot of these junipers look like ponderosa pine trees because they are uh, drinking at the well so well. Uh, they have unlimited resources compared to those junipers on southern facing aspects, those rocky slopes, ridge lines, where um, they would have been protected by fire. And so you get those old growth junipers. And that was another reason why we wanted to treat where we were, because we had less risk of, of cutting down old growth juniper. Uh, we only wanted to go for those young junipers and remove them. And also, uh, by selecting these sites, we had a more marketable uh, juniper for landowners if they wanted to market the juniper for later use, uh, be it wood cutting, uh, for wood, firewood, or for marketing it for, to be cut into uh, timber. So um, this is an example of a project we did uh, down in Wheeler County, uh, close to Mitchell, in which the partners were NRCS and the Gillum Soil and Water Conservation District using money uh, through OWEB. And we also were uh, working with the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. 
So um, as you can see, there was 1,100 acres treated. Uh, it's a four mile long ridge. Um, the idea was to improve rangeland health and also to uh, liberate water to enter back into the system. The hope being that it'll get back into the John Day and the tributaries to uh, reduce stream temperatures, to increase flows, and to benefit the steelhead. If you went back to the first uh, slide, uh, that's actually a picture of this project after the uh, the uh, juniper have been cut. So it gives you a, a sense of the scale uh, of this cut. Most of our uh, projects now are currently being cut with uh, a faller buncher with a hot saw. So we approach it kind of as a logging, similar to a logging exercise, um, obviously with the intent of uh, being a lot less disruptive. So we try to keep the disturbance down to a bare minimum, um, but we can, we can cut a lot of juniper in a day with a faller buncher. And where we're cutting on those north facing aspects, we don't have as much problems with rocks and other things that uh, guys running machinery do not like. Um, so we've been able to get, you know, at some points uh, in 40% canopy cover, we're getting 20 acres a day with the faller buncher um, and very little uh, disturbance. And that's our goal, um, keeping, you know, we treat when the soils or conditions are right because uh, our intent is to not do more harm by doing the treatment. Obviously, in some cases, there is a little disturbance, um, but overall, um, these sites have, re have reacted very well and have come back um, extraordinarily well. Another goal of ours um, that goes along with this is reintroducing prescribed burning back into uh, this area. Uh, it's a more natural um, treatment. As mentioned earlier, it's kind of one of the reasons why we're in this predicament is the lack of fire on the landscape. And um, so we've had many, quite a few producers take advantage of the prescribed burning and we've had great results. Um, we've probably burned 10,000 plus acres in, in Wheeler County in the last 10 years. And um, so far, knock on wood, we've not had any problems. Um, we have found that the producers that are most willing to do burning are the large producers. So if we're talking 10, 20, 30,000 acre properties, uh, they're more willing to do it because their risk tolerance is higher because the properties are larger and they have less chance of the fire getting off on their neighbor, which is always a concern. And that's it. Hopefully I didn't run over. <laughs> Thank you, Damon. Perfect. Um, this is uh, just a little reminder for folks to, to use the chat at the bottom of the screen to ask questions and um, we'll save them for the end. Um, moving down Highway 97 to the Crooked River, we're gonna hear from Chris Gannon of Madras, Oregon. Chris has worked for the Forest Service, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality before starting with the Crooked River Watershed Council. The council focuses on both upland watershed improvements and fish reintroduction into the lower Crooked River geography. Welcome, Chris. Yes, thank you, Terry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The first thing I wanna show you is a map of the location of our watershed. Uh, we are pretty much central as it relates to the geographic center of the state. In fact, the small town of Post, Oregon is the geographic center of the state, not the geopolitical center, mind you, but the geographical center. Uh, next slide, please. The watershed is about 3 million acres. It drains from east to west. It's a working lands watershed, which generally means it's mostly ranching and irrigated agriculture, ranching in the upper reaches, uh, mostly irrigated agriculture in the lower sections of the watershed. Because it's a working lands watershed, uh, we have a lot of pressure to uh, to do the right thing with natural resources. The, by the right thing, I mean manage them very carefully. Uh, in the Crooked River watershed of the 3 million acres, we've got about 600,000 acres of western juniper occupied 
land. So that's about 20% in total of our watershed. Ownership wise, the watershed is about roughly 50-50 private uh, to federal and state ownership. So about half the watershed is in private hands. Um, you've already heard from some of the other speakers about what juniper does when it encroaches on the landscape. In this photo here that I'm showing of Horse Heaven Creek, you can see the uh, in the background, that's really sort of phase two juniper coming down off the slopes in the background, sort of encroaching uh, downhill into the floodplain. In fact, in the floodplain itself, you can see these individual smaller juniper uh, that are really sort of phase one. Uh, this is a real problem. Uh, in this photo because, of course, we never want to see juniper down on our most productive soil types, which typically in the dry western states occur on floodplains along creeks and rivers. Um, what happens when juniper tend to dominate a site over time is it really uh, advances the ecological damage, if you will. And in fact, when juniper fully occupy a site, it becomes really a race to the bottom, ecologically speaking, in terms of uh, ecological health. Uh, this photo here is taken from the upper watershed, upper crooked, and it's really meant to represent uh, mechanical treatments. We typically come in to remove juniper with uh, fellers, uh, traditional timber cutters that come in, very, very difficult work, steep slopes, dry, hot conditions. Uh, juniper themselves are not really easy trees to cut. They typically eat up saw blades and, and dull saws very fast. In this photo, I, I really want to show you um, the way we approach controlling juniper in the crooked is to set up sites for eventual burning. So we know we cannot afford to cut every single juniper that we would like off the landscape, but what we can do is spend enough money to cut juniper and prep a site for a fire that we would set usually three to five years following the initial treatment. This is a photo here that's set up basically um, for the, um, the pending fire that's coming in the next couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's another site that's more recently cut. You can still see the green needles on all the down juniper. Uh, I included this photo because it's really um, a good example of a, of a rock knob, kind of in the center of the photo right in here is a rock outcrop. And that's typically where you will find, in fact, this very large juniper here, uh, probably representative. Here's a couple more large ones, representative more natural uh, micro sites where juniper tend to survive natural fire regimes, uh, historical fire regimes, and that's typically where you find, you know, 300, 400 year old juniper. Uh, pretty rare otherwise on the landscape. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a photo of uh, the follow-up treatments. As I mentioned, fire is really one of the, the, the most economical and efficient tools to use strictly from an ecological perspective. Uh, you can treat many, many more acres with fire than you can with mechanical or, or timber felling treatments. So ultimately, while this photo here um, drives, you know, several concerns about smoke management, air quality, uh, release of carbon perhaps into the atmosphere, ultimately I think one of the uh, most economical ways to uh, treat large, large landscapes of juniper, which we need to do, is by reintroducing uh, fire at, at a very large scale. Um, as we advance one more slide, I will just sort of, I guess, finish by saying I think some of the real challenges that we've seen sort of marrying up or mashing up ecological restoration work with uh, utilization of juniper is that the harvestable juniper, the, the, the key individual junipers that the mills really want and desire are spread out far and few between. So you have to cover a lot of ground to get to the trees you really want for the mill. Uh, that ground, as a reminder, is usually very steep, uh, thin soils on south facing slopes. Uh, it's not the easiest place to try to harvest. So I think distances to mills, I think just the nature of how juniper grow and how you might develop a harvest pattern or scheme tend to be some of the larger challenges with utilization. Um, I think, Terry, I might wrap it up there with one final note. When we cut juniper, mechanically cut it to prep for these fires, it's about $90 to $120 an acre rate. Uh, when we burn the same acre, it's usually around $10 to $20 an acre, just to give you a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, I think I'll save some time for more questions, perhaps. 
Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that very much. Um, so the idea was to move out of the science realm um, for the next two speakers and introduce um, Jim Epley uh, from JMB Sawmill in Wheeler County. Um, Jim is the descendants of homesteaders who settled in Eastern Oregon in the late 1800s. He will share stories about how Juniper has changed his family's landscape and stories about his mill operation. Hello, Jim. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So uh, I'm fourth generation working on the ranch over here in Wither County. Um, the story starts in uh, 97 uh, when I, I moved back in 95 and started in 97 where we're seeing a huge amount of water reduction and decrease in grasses. And so we started uh, clearing the juniper around the springs and we were just piling and burning. <laughs> so in uh, 97 or 98, I decided to buy a small bandsaw mill uh, to start using the wood here on the ranch. And that uh, actually ended up just morphing into a business. <laughs> so, uh, the first the first picture that you see there is actually a black and white photo in, sometime in the 1920s. And it's awfully hard to see the ridge in the background, but there's no trees on that ridge. The photo next to it is uh, at the same site. Um, right behind that pile of brush, uh, that's actually in a field that was last farmed 25 years ago. That's how fast the juniper has been growing. So, so it, it's pretty amazing. That's that's just how the juniper keeps encroaching on the land. Um, over the course of uh, of doing this as a business, what we've noticed, uh, we started putting a lot of the a lot of the trees that we can't use in the draws to stop erosion. And over the years, we're getting that sediment buildup. Uh, there were a lot of those draws you couldn't even ride a horse across, and now they're you know 10, 15 feet across, grass growing in the bottom of them. So that's not a lot of good that way. Uh, the last two years, uh, in our skidding process of the trees, we were falling the trees and just limiting them up at that location. Now we're skidding the whole tree, and we're seeing the native bunch grass come back uh, the very next spring. Mm. Uh, it, 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 it's pretty amazing. Uh, that there is just how uh, I started with a with a small bandsaw mill, and I've progressed now to where we're using bigger mills and skid steers and <laughs> all kinds of equipment. Um, one of the uh, issues that we do have is we we end up with a lot of this slab wood um, that makes great firewood, but really no way to get rid of it. And can't really find a use for it. Um, in the mill site on the left, uh, we we take the mill right to the trees, so we we probably move about once every three weeks. I have three employees that we we fall the trees by hand and work them all up on site. Mm. There's a sustainable truck getting ready to go out with the load on it. That's awesome. Sweet. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions for Jim, please uh, put them in the chat. We'll, we'll keep those for the end. Um, next up is uh, Levi Latrell of Levi's Sawmills in Lapine, Oregon. Uh, Levi owns and operates a mill in Lapine, which cuts juniper and blue pine for various loggers in the surrounding region. Uh, Levi, are you there? I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Levi. I'm here in Lapine. Um, I I grew up in Oregon, over on the coast, Coos Bay. Kind of kind of jumped around for for a few years after that, college and 15 years in Colorado. Moved back to Oregon. Uh, uh, was was a lineman for a while, and and uh, and then ended up with a with a little sawmill as as kind of a hobby, um, but uh, eventually. Uh, Kind of like Jim, it, it morphed into a business, and uh, and I saw saw the need for uh, custom, you know, niche, niche product uh, timber out here. So um, seemed like as as soon as I started milling, uh, people started asking for juniper. So uh, especially out here, you know, on this side of the mountains, uh, it's, people are are very aware of the product, um, and and it's. Uh, it's getting more and more out there where, where more and more people recognize its benefits and 
and are constantly asking me for it. So, um, but uh, anyway, I I don't ju I don't just do juniper. Uh, I if I tried to do juniper 100%, I I don't think I would have stayed in business very long. Uh, it's, it's very very challenging to get a consistent log supply. Uh, I've, I've never turned a, a log truck load of, of logs away, uh, and I and I still uh, am, am constantly struggling to, to have enough logs here at the mill. Uh, it's, you know, it, a few of the other speakers have talked about the challenges there with with you know there, there's a lot of a lot of acreage being cleared. Uh, not a lot of those logs end up making it to to the mill. Um, a lot of that ends up getting burned, uh, unfortunately, and, and economically, it's it's tough to uh, to make it work to get to get every every saw log that's out there to to a mill. Um, but uh, anyway, on, on my mill side, um, you know, when you're if if you're going to mill juniper, uh, what I've found is uh, you you have to have a very very efficient operation. Um, you've got to be able to run through a, a fairly large volume uh, for a small mill anyway uh you know we're we're our little mills are are nothing like the the big pine mills or anything out there but uh when i when i mean uh a bigger operation i'm talking you know 100 logs a day kind of thing uh which which for juniper and you know running a two or three or four man crew with with the limited equipment we have uh doing 100 logs in a day is is uh that's that's a pretty good day um but we we can do that uh pretty consistently um with the operation we have we we're set up permanently uh you know jim has a great operation where he can he can move around to two logs on his property uh i bring logs in from from loggers so i'm in a permanent spot and then you know we bring the logs to the mill but um but you know the most Kind of the most efficient way of doing it when you're when you're in the juniper uh, is to is to kind of have a set product line, uh, which which means that um, you know say if I if I was milling pine, somebody wanted say six units of four by fours, uh, no problem we'd whip that out in two days. You know you might get ten to twenty four by fours out of a log. Uh, juniper is totally different. Uh, you get you get one four by four out of a six inch diameter log <laughs> and and if you're going to fill a unit you have to mill 80 of those logs uh and so you know we just we take the logs as they come across the mill and we make the best product that that log will make so uh we make four by four five by five six by six uh the higher quality logs will take some two by six and some two by eight out of uh and then we end up with a, a lot of one inch uh fencing products as you're as you're taking the the taper out of the log, um, but that allows us to to work pretty efficiently um, and uh, and make make the most use out of the logs. Um, uh, Jim Jim mentioned the the slab wood. Uh, we we actually uh, we we fill up a, a steel rack next to the mill with that slab wood. We band it up when it's full, uh, put it off in the corner of the yard, and in the fall we'll sell four or five hundred units of of that slab wood so uh you know depending on where you are and how you're operating things there there is there is a fairly good market for that people people love to burn it um and i i sell it really really cheap just to just because we end up with so much of it that i've got to get rid of it so now sawdust i don't know i haven't figured that one out <laughs> i've got i've got mountains of sawdust around here and i don't know what to do with that so if anyone has any uh any ideas on getting rid of uh you know several hundred yards of sawdust please let me know <laughs> um, but uh you know that yeah the, there's there's constantly challenges with with juniper it's it's unlike anything else out there uh you know what if i'm milling pine or cedar or fir it's it's pretty pretty easy and straightforward compared to the juniper um but by far the biggest challenge for me is is just a consistent log supply. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I might get 20 log truck loads uh, from a big job in a month. Uh, and then I might go six or eight months without 
without any loads. So it's uh, it's pretty tough. Uh, and and what I'm doing is uh, is it just takes time. You know, it uh, trying to develop relationships with loggers, uh, with landowners. Um, you know, getting them to understand that that there is a market uh, and, and it is viable and, and you know, I can par uh, pay a fair price for the logs. Uh, that, that just takes time and, and working with, with these guys. And, uh, and it seems like once I've developed that relationship, they, they do keep continuing to, to work for me and, uh, and make things work. But boy, it takes a while. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a, it's a, for sure. Uh, one of the hardest things I see is, uh, especially, especially down in Southern Oregon, uh, you know, I, I, I've toured thousands and thousands and thousands of acres where, where you see these juniper that have been logged and they've been piled up in these piles that are, you know, 40 feet tall and a hundred yards long. And, and there's hundreds of these piles. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, every one of those piles is, is just slated to be burned. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of usable timber, a lot of saw logs in those piles of wood. Uh, and so one of the things I'm working on is, is trying to, uh, A, convince the landowners that, that we should go in there and try and clean those logs up into saw logs and that they'll get paid for it, uh, instead of burning it. Um, and then finding a logger who, is willing to do that, that, that has the time or the resources or the crew uh, or the drive to, to do it. Um, so I've recently, I, I, I partnered up with, uh, with a new logger. Um, I bought a, I bought a used delimmer and, uh, and we're trying to make it happen, uh, getting a little bit more involved in, in that side of things. So uh, that, you know, the outcome, the final outcome is, is yet to be determined there, but, but I'm working on it. So, um, anyway, I, I really believe in the juniper market. I, I, uh, I believe in the product. I believe in the story. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it can be a really, really positive thing for, for everyone from the landowners, uh, to, you know, public lands to, uh, the loggers and, and the mill owners. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the final, the final product going out to the customers uh i have customers in here at the mill every single day and and they they love juniper uh they can't get enough of it so um there's there's a great market for it i feel like it's mostly untapped uh it's just a matter of getting those logs to the mill i'm ready to mill that's that's about all i have nice thank you levi i very much appreciate that and it, um we did intentionally go out and ask Levi and Jim just um, to join us today because they do represent two different types of uh, sawmills in the juniper business. We work, um, and there is a network of um, mills at a similar scale um, to their operations scattered out in Eastern Oregon. Um, and I have to say, after visiting a ton of automated sawmills in my day, um, these folks working at, at these mills really have an eye for what product to get out of a log that is tapering pretty quickly over even 16 feet. Um, and they don't have laser scanners and a lot of the other fancy bells and whistles that the big production mills have. Um, so just want to give a shout out to Levi and Jim and thank them for their time today. If you hear a sawmill winding up in the background, it's probably one of them going back to work. So thanks, fellas. Um, Next up, we're going to transition to the west side. Uh, we couldn't forget about the west side of Oregon uh, and talk to two folks um, more on the customer end. First, we're going to hear from Jennifer Hake. Uh, Jennifer is a juniper enthusiast and s and Wood customer who is currently retired. Um, she was born in Wyoming and moved to Beaverton in 1996 to work for Intel. She bought her home on Juniper Terrace then and has lived there for 24 years. Uh, her deck project on the back of her house on Juniper Terrace was the first large project she's done in her backyard. Uh, Jennifer, welcome to Sustainable Wood Stories. Hi there. Um, well, I'm kind of the, the end of the story, I guess. I, uh, I, like Terry said, I live in Beaverton 
and I've lived in this house on Juniper Terrace for 24 years. And finally, I actually, I'll, I'll show you know, that I have a, I have a Juniper Terrace on my Juniper Terrace. So that's pretty exciting. And, uh, and it's something I am really in love with Juniper. So it all started, I don't know, we have the next slide of the backyard. There's the backyard. And uh, before, what, what really started it, and you can barely see it, but underneath that door, kind of that, that door is a, is a 24 year old wooden steps down to the backyard that finally was just disintegrating. So last year I knew I had to rebuild those steps. And just like you take the doorknob off, you'd be careful, you might have your house down to the studs. I thought, well, maybe I'll build it back. <laughs> so that was what I had done. They, my owners before had built a pad. I don't know if we, we probably don't have a picture of that, but. I looked at, so we laid it out and laid it out. get into the pine trees, but uh, I looked at the different things I could build a deck with. Oh, there it is. Right. You can see the layout and you can see those falling apart steps. So I thought, well, what I really would do is I could put treks. That was one of my choices for this deck. And I, I would do that because that's good for the environment, but my house is such a cottage house and it's really pretty. And I thought, and you know, Trex, it's, it's just not that really that much character and not that attractive. So I thought, well, and then my contractor, Chuck said, well, what about Epi? That's more sustainable. But I did some reading and there's real problems with that wood. So that was not a choice I would make. And commercial cedar wasn't something I just, didn't like the idea of using trees that were you know cut down like that so I did an internet search for recycled decking or sustainable and up popped up sustainable wood so I went to the website and looked to see what kind of decking there was and I saw this juniper so I went out over to there and I took a look and that was it I fell in love with it and my contractor Chuck also did so that was the end of it so chuck and i went over and we actually at the, the shop picked out board by board the eight foot boards that we wanted and we picked out the ones that had the most knots and the most holes that had the most character and we picked out ones for the for the deck the floor of the deck and then the spindles were decking that uh, the sustainable wood sent out to be milled for us. So I got the posts and I got the decking and then those spindles. And then Chuck did this beautiful job of putting this, this uh, wood down in these beautiful knots. And he and I actually would go, I went into the inside of the house and he took the posts and he would place each post. You can see that post in the back with that big kind of knot in it. So he would turn them all until we had the best look of what we had for that and then he did that really wonderful floating railing and you can see the spindles don't really obstruct it at all so that and he, he worked really well the eight feet you can't see it but there's some vertical boards that across the middle that that take up the eight feet and then you can barely oh there you can tell so see on that left one that's what the juniper looks like before it's sealing which is really beautiful but i knew i had to seal it because it's a south facing deck and you're just not going to have much luck with it not turning gray and white so i was recommended by uh sustainable woods to go to timber pro and they have some wonderful natural seals that's durable and really beautiful so i picked a really light color one up from the lightest because it's a south facing deck and you could see on that little landing that's what has been sealed one time and then um the the on the left the others is before after the seaming and you can see also those vertical ones and we really we picked as much as we could the knots and everything because it had so much character and then on the right you can see the actual ceiling and then and then on the next slide then this is the the, uh, the finished deck that you that is right now so it's a huge difference from those falling down wood steps and it's absolutely beautiful i couldn't have had a prettier prettier thing or really the best best of all worlds because it's 
it's first of all the juniper is beautiful and it's destructive on the rangeland but look at what it looks like you know when it's in a on a house and it's rugged and long-lived and and it's it's really kind of a charismatic living kind of creature to me sometimes chuck and i just stand we look and we say oh look at this one this one this is my favorite <laughs> and best of all it's good for the planet so it was something that i felt like was you know, taking care of oregon the high plains it was helping apparently now i heal it so hear it's so hard to mill. it's not as much valuable for the mills as it is just for the planet but for me it's really uh, a really fantastic outcome and awesome thing. So that's my story of my juniper deck on Juniper Terrace. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, that, that is a lovely project for sure. Um, so I know we're a little bit over time, but if you could stick with us, um, we do have one more speaker and just some wrap up notes. We, uh, we promise to sharpen up our, our lead in and the next sustainable wood story in a couple months. So, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Jim Desmond of Portland, Oregon has been the state director of the Nature Conservancy in Oregon since 2015. Under Jim's leadership, TNC Oregon has launched ambitious programs to protect Oregon's coastal estuaries and sagebrush, sagebrush desert and currently is completing a $60 million fundraising campaign. Uh, Jim's here today to, to talk a little bit about TNC's work on its own land and um, also their amazingly beautiful project in Inner Southeast. Um, that was a great use of some of their juniper. Thanks for coming, Jim. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, so we have a little bit of an unusual uh, story to tell in all this because we were actually on both ends of the lifestyle uh, like excuse me life cycle uh of both the where the wood came from itself and then its ultimate use so you're looking at our portland office building there which was a major redo a year ago of a of a wood frame building the three-story per portion on the right there was the existing building it was built in 1972 it was uh, really wasn't suiting our business needs well. It had one conference room for 43 people. Windows were not great. It was a, it had seven HVAC systems, believe it or not, in a 12,000 square foot building. It was an energy nightmare and, and, and didn't serve our business needs. So we decided to stay in our neighborhood and redo the building. Um, and then they're facing us the one story addition, which is actually a cross laminated timber structure that was all FSC certified wood that Sustainable Northwest also helped us procure, um, which is a multi uh, uh, use uh, conference center that's in, in our building, the Oregon, uh, the Oregon Conservation Center. Um, uh, facing us there directly, that wood panel, let's go back, uh, that wood paneling that you see all along the ground floor, both there and then coming around the side down 14th, um, that's all juniper. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll tell the story there. Um, when we started the project, uh, our development team, which is called Project, which, and, and they're very, we picked them because they were known for advanced use of advanced wood products and sustainable, uh, uh, natural resource and other uh, uses uh, was Tom Cody and Anyale Holova, who are both leaders in the progressive green building movement in Portland. And the architect was Thomas Robinson from Lever. And when we sat down in the first meetings with them, we told, you know, we, we settled on our goal, which was to tell the story of the Nature Conservancy in Oregon. And we wanted to use all Oregon based products and particularly ones that that were beneficial from a conservation perspective and that they really took that challenge on. So at one point they asked us about Juniper, what was our view on that? And we said, well, we spent a lot of time trying to get rid of it. And, uh, and they were trying to promote the use of it um, as paneling on the outside of buildings. They believe from their perspective that it was an extremely dur durable, uh, cost-effective product but it hadn't you know it was thought of as being hard to work with it really hadn't come into vogue yet and they were willing wondering if we were willing to try it 
And I said that not only were we willing to try it, we wanted to try it, but only if we could get the wood from one of our preserves. So to the next slide here, um, we own a, just like um, uh, the house on Juniper Terrace, we own a preserve, um, it'll come up in the slide here, um, called the Juniper Hills Preserve that's 33 miles due east of Prineville. And it's directly south of the Ochico National Forest. Um, and we, despite the name, the Juniper Hills Preserve, we actually try to remove a lot of the juniper. And we had just started, I, I looked out around the state to see if there was someplace we could get juniper. And my staff there said that, that they were planning a big project and that end use of the wood was important to them too. So the project was to um, uh, both do annual grass treatments reintroduce fire, do some control burns, and do some juniper removal. And we had a large grant to do the work and, and wanted to create a 500 acre burn unit. Um, so that line you see kind of in the back there, that was the fire break that was, um, that was created for the burn. And there was juniper along that ridge that was taken down. So there was a 75 foot break that was a mile long. So the fire that you're looking at was actually done the night before the big fire to clear the fire line a little more and get rid of the smaller uh, biomass that was on the ground. And um, that just turned out to be great. The fire was very successful. Um, the pictures on the right are the preserve pictures. And then if you go to the next slide, um, so Sustainable Northwest was working with us. We're just fantastic, by the way. We can't, we just can't thank everyone there enough. We never could have done this without their expertise. Um, so besides the paneling on the outside that you see on the right there with our sign that goes around the building, it's really attractive. Um, we also use Juniper there at the front desk. And then if we go to the next slide on our second floor there on the right, um, that's our uh, lounge uh, and lunch area and both the seating there and the tables are juniper and then on the left you see a little bit more of the decking outside uh, on the side of the building. We have a lot of um, other design folks have come by the building. Uh, it's in a prominent place if anybody uh, not from Portland it's between uh, Morrison and Belmont which are two main streets on our east side fairly close to downtown. They're both highly trafficked very visible building um, before we had this nondescript building that nobody even ever noticed was there and now we got people walking down the street taking photos of the building and I think that the juniper paneling has a lot to do with that so the logs went from this conservation project that we wanted to do to the mill and then came to Portland and ended up telling a much bigger story both about conservation but also about what we hope will be the future of wood products in the design community in Portland and it really the building has really spoken to our values and has truly become the place where nature and people meet. My staff is dying to get back in there um, and uh, as an organization worldwide we're trying to promote the responsible use of wood products and th this just could not have worked out better for us. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot. appreciate being on this panel. Thank you, Jim. I very much appreciate that. And um, unlike Jennifer's project, which is a little more private, um, I get to walk by the Nature Conservancy once a week, so I'm keeping an eye on the siding. Um, we did get a question in about the siding and if it was tongue and grooved, and um, the answer is, is yes, yeah, I do believe it was. Uh, it's a vertical application, and um, our recommendation here is for vertical juniper to be tongue and groove to provide a little bit of interlock, interlocking stability between each board. Um, but yeah, it's a great, great exterior use um, and can be seen by just walking down 14th and, uh, and Belmont there. So um, most of the questions it seems like were answered through the chat. Um, and I appreciate our panelists for jumping in there and, and taking care of uh, that for, for the, the, the folks. There was a question about maybe uh, has Juniper been marketed internationally? Um, in, not in a, in a, in a huge way. Uh, we did send um, some um, container loads of Juniper 
to Asia last year. Um, but I think the aesthetic is a little bit, uh, it might be a little bit out of um, their kind of design world. I don't actually know what happened to those container loads at this stage, um, but we've even run into some resistance marketing it to places like California where, um, you know, using redwood for exterior purposes is, is um, a bit of a faux pas. People are looking for an alternative, but the rustic nature of it is, is sort of a hill we're still trying to climb. Um, so, so I just want to wrap up. Thanks for your patience. Um, and I want to thank our presenters for sharing their research and their stories and their perspectives. Sustainable Northwest Woods mission is to connect Pacific Northwest um, sustainable wood suppliers with markets near and far. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be a bridge between improving ecosystems and the built environment, between rural and urban communities, and between one person's dream and a thriving community. This show has been recorded today and it will be posted on our website within a week, so please pass it along to your friends. Our next show will be in early August and it will cover the amazing efforts of using working forest principles to reestablish Oregon white oak habitat here in the Willamette Valley. Um, so to stay in touch, sign up for our newsletter at www.snwwood and look for us on Instagram and Facebook. And if you really need to see Juniper in person, Come visit us in Southeast Portland at our lumber yard. We're open Monday to Friday, eight to five. And uh, with that, thank you. Everyone be safe. Have a nice afternoon and may the forest be with you. I wanted to say that.